Hi, my name is Katherine Adamek, and I'm here speaking with Pastor Pete Haskins about a 10-day silent retreat that I just got back from. Uh, the type of retreat was called a Vipassana meditation, and the word Vipassana means to see things as they really are. So it was a, a really deep and meaningful spiritual experience, an invitation to slow down and really listen to God and have that personal connection and hear what he has to say. Uh, we also discuss my personal transition from the life of a professional athlete into my life now working as a health and wellness professional in a retirement community. Pete and I work here together and it's been extremely meaningful for my spiritual growth to come out of the world where success is more important than happiness and into the world where happiness is an integral part of spiritual growth. See everybody, Catherine is here and give her a big hand. Very good. We're so excited that she is here. So excited that she is in our, our um, Fairway family, but also that she is here today to share with us some of her insights about a, a retreat, spiritual retreat that she had uh, not too long ago. So she is uh, here to share those things. I know that uh, many of you know about her background. Um, but so she's going to share a little bit about that. So we're going to just kind of uh, jump into this and, and uh, make sure that um, we have a little bit of background in terms of uh, where she's coming from. So, um, Catherine, we're going to sh be sharing this microphone back and forth. So hopefully you won't have to hear from me too much uh, today. And you, you can focus on what Catherine is saying about her insights into this retreat. But there is a tremendous um, difference in the, uh, in the environment from your uh, time in professional sports and your time here at Fairway and at PHS in just the general shift. So that, in, in terms of your own personal life, that's been quite a, a shift in, in how you see the world and how you're interacting with people. Um, so just kind of give us a, a little glimpse into the adjustment from that professional sports uh, atmosphere to here and then how you got into the idea of going to that retreat. Yeah, definitely. So all of you know that I, I was a short track speed skater and I moved to Milwaukee initially to coach. Eventually I decided to compete again, um, but let me back up a little bit. So. I, I was very successful early on in my career. And in 2010, I got a silver and a bronze medal at the Vancouver Olympics. Um, and then I went immediately into injury after injury after injury. And so two or three years into this process, I'd had three hip surgeries, uh, several, several blown out discs, and it just got to the point where I was convinced that I would be spending the rest of my life in chronic pain. I was 21 at this point. Um, and so I basically was forced to retire from competition. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do the things required to be an elite athlete anymore. So I started coaching and really learned how professional sports, the professional sport environment is not a healthy environment. It, it may be very common because we all have professional sports that we like to watch, but it's not really a healthy environment. And as a coach, I really struggled with my mental health to the point where um, there was a day when I decided, like, I think I have to go back into competition just because now that I'm aware of how unhealthy the environment I was in was, I'd like to do this in a healthier way. And that's when my sports psychologist got me into meditating. And I remember calling him and telling him, this is what I wanna do, and I'm, I'm so much older now, I have no idea if I'll be successful in 2018 like I was in 2010, but I feel like I have to try. And he got me into meditating, and that was the beginning of the next phase of my life, of just learning how to have a different relationship with myself. And I did compete in a way that I was proud of at the 2018 Olympic trials, and then I kept on meditating. And then COVID happened, and meditating became my medicine. And if I did not put my butt on a yoga mat and meditate every morning, I was a nightmare to be around. You, we'll bring my husband next time and he can, <laughs> he can tell you about it. Um, so when I recognized 
that I could make myself happier and healthier through meditating, I started meditating every day. I started working, one of my yoga instructors also does workshops on meditation, and he is who recommended that if, if I really want to be serious about it, to try going to one of these 10-day silent retreats and really learn about how much peace and serenity a daily meditation practice can bring to your life. So that's kind of the transition from elite athletics where I was successful but very unhealthy, very unhappy into where I am now, which is much a, a more peaceful, more serene place. And again, I know I mention this in my chair classes all the time, how grateful I am to work at a faith-based place because working here has had a direct impact on my spiritual growth. And it's one of the most things I could possibly be grateful for at this time in my life. My life has been impacted by meditation as well, and that has helped me get through uh, some episodes in my life where I needed more with my connection with God than just talking to God and not feeling as if I was getting a response. I don't know, that, that sounds kind of blunt, but sometimes when you pray, you don't feel like you hear anything back. And one of the things that meditation has helped me with is... Uh, learn how to listen to God and learning how to how to have an inner silence because whenever I try to pray when I tried to meditate without instruction um, I just had random thoughts and I would have daydreams has anyone tried to meditate and you just daydream right so one of the mantras the mantra that I use is the Jesus prayer Lord Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy on me a sinner so that is the mantra that helped get me into that. So what is it that meditation, why was meditation attractive to you? Because for me it was just, I want to know what God is saying because with me it was just random thoughts. Mm. So my random thoughts are very mean and obnoxious. And my random thoughts are not what I need from the store or if I'm hungry, like my thoughts, they're very in line with my athlete thoughts, which is if you're not winning, you're losing. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult mindset to be in. Um, I mean, I don't know that perfectionism describes it. I have a few other friends who were professional athletes and we talk about how when from a very young age, like I'm thinking the first time I kind of learned this lesson was at 12 years old, that um, I made it to my first national championship, but I only qualified the last spot. Four people got to go and I got fourth. And my coaches were mad at me for getting fourth. And I'm like, I made it. This is exactly everything we wanted. And they're like, you should have won. So that's, that's what I grew up with from a very young age. Like, good enough isn't good enough. But it got worse. The longer I competed at an elite level, I spent years of my life genuinely feeling like and being treated like winning is expected, so therefore not special, and losing is not tolerated. So there was really no bright side in my life for several years, I'd say for at least an entire quad um, which is our four-year cycle, and then especially adding the injuries onto that. Um, the way that I learned to talk to myself while I was injured directly resulted in, in panic attacks, anxiety, anxious depressive disorder. I mean, I was, my team doctors, I guess they were doing the best they could, but you know, in elite sports, if you have a problem, there's a medicine for that. You know, the solution isn't to take time off. It's not to go visit with your family or make more friends or go to church. This, here's your Celebrex. Here's your cortisone shot. Here's your anti-anxiety medication. Shut up and train harder. That was my personal experience as a professional athlete. And I don't think I'm alone in that. We are seeing so many mental, mental health issues in athletics nowadays. Um, I'm just the first generation that gets to speak openly about it. That sounds amazingly stressful. And I know from my standpoint, I had no idea, you know, that, that, that the Olympic, just professional athletes and professional athletes all, all over are having to deal with that kind of um, trauma, really. It's, I mean, you've got some, 
I'm sure some PTSD issues in terms of really trying to get out of that mindset. So one of the things that I would imagine attracted you to this retreat was just, all right, let's see if I can really kickstart this sense of, of communicating with God and getting out of that mindset of the competitive nature, because I imagine the competitive nature really kind of overflows into other avenues in your life, and it's hard to kind of uh, mark those off. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. If There is no way to say, well, I think like this when I'm being an athlete, and I think like this when I'm being Catherine. I had my athlete inner voice, and that was it. So when I was done competing, my head was a dark, scary place. And that's why meditation became my medicine. That's why um, if I missed my morning meditation, I was very difficult to be around. I was very angry to your point. Um, you know, PTSD symptoms are real. Complex PTSD symptoms are real. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but what I, learned, what I know looking back is that the amount of meditating that I did is the reason why I was able to let go of those thoughts. And so when, I mean, let me say this right, like being hard on yourself, being anxious, being jealous, being angry and resentful. Pete, you taught me this. Um, that's not God. That's not how God wants you to think. That's not the way he wants you to live in your head for this one precious life. So I didn't know that I was going down a spiritual path when I started. I just knew that it helped. And then as I went down the path, I realized how much spirit I could actually bring into my life. Wow, that's awesome. So really, what, what, I mean, I've known you for a little over a year, but what I'm witnessing is a spiritual awakening in you. And that's been a really wonderful thing to witness. And I, I think that we are all seeing that. We're all kind of participating with you in, in we're your fans in this, uh, and, and your journey. And, and that's one of the things that makes our community a wonderful place is that we're here to support each other in this journey. And that's, and that's what this is. So um, I just think that's wonderful. Um, so let's talk specifically about that retreat. How did you, how did you hear about it? I know that you were on the waiting list for a while and so it's hard to get into and kind of describe it um, for those of you, uh, she was on a 10-day silent retreat. So can you imagine not talking for 10 days? So that is a, a very interesting uh, a proposition. So let's, let's hear a little bit of the details. So my, the meditation teacher I was working with at my yoga studio is who initially said, you know, you can keep coming to my workshops, but you seem to really like this, so maybe you want to go just do the retreat, um, the, the same things that he had learned, the way he had learned how to study. Um, and so it's, it's a 10-day silent retreat. You could talk to the teacher and the student manager, but you couldn't talk to your, your fellow classmates. And we found out later on in the retreat that a big reason for that is because they want you to have your own spiritual experience. And so at the end of the retreat, when I was talking to others, uh, one person would see a light and another person would see, um, you know, I guess I can't remember everyone's, but I remember specifically this person saw a light, but I saw more like uh, a forest with a pretty creek, you know, and like she, her spiritual awakening, I suppose, like her version of that was different from mine. And if we had been allowed to talk about it during the retreat, that her experience would have tainted my experience and vice versa. So to your point about being able to listen to God, the big reason that you don't talk to each other is because you're not there to listen to anybody else. You're there to listen to your, your higher power and what they have, what he or she, they have to say to you. Um, and, um, Hold on, I want to I want to answer your question, but I have to go back a second in my head. <clears throat> so the not talking was actually not that difficult, but what was difficult was the amount of stillness that was required, which always brought to mind for me the passage be still and know that I am God. And it it hadn't occurred to me before that my mental busyness 
was creating my physical busyness. And I've talked to residents here who have said, I cannot sit still. I just can't do it. I have to be moving all the time. And my experience was, yeah, when your thoughts are going 90 miles an hour all the time, your body kind of follows. But when you sit still long enough, your thoughts slow down and then your body starts to feel more at peace. So that happened on probably day four or five for me of the retreat. I know that in the, in the early church, they have a couple terms and the, the first one is called metanoia and that is the term that means turning inward. And when I turn inward, and maybe some of you who have tried to meditate, when I turn inward, I just, it's like, ha it's like having a radio station and you just turn the dial and it's just static, right? You just, once in a while you find a station. And the key for me was, was getting to that point where I went, when I, when I go inward is to develop a sense of stillness and that's called hesychasm. So when you go inward and you, and you find that place of solace, that, that place where you can actually stop thinking and your mind can stop racing is one of the keys because then the stillness brings about a certain amount of, of presence of God. Whereas prior to, I was going, I, I went about my day and all I was doing was daydreaming. Mm. And I got real tired of just daydreaming, right? And just an, an outward prayer. So I wanted an experience inwardly. So this retreat was probably one of the best things for you because it really allowed you to kind of kickstart that that and, and have experience because I think we need experience of this to help lead us on. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. And I remember again, probably once I got into that day four or five of the retreat, there was something going on back home that had been on my mind the whole time. And I went to the teacher about it. You know, I'm really struggling with this. I'm trying to be still and to let go of all of these hectic thoughts, but I have this one thing that keeps coming up. And she encouraged me to be present and to feel my body. And she said, I promise you, whatever's happening, you're having a sensation, something's happening, and immediately your brain is going off into thought. And it's that, maybe it's the same as that daydreaming thing of like, instead of being completely still and completely present and listening to what my body has to say to me, um, I just had this habit from my athlete life of, let me just get really busy instead. And specifically, let me analyze everything and try to, try, try to solve the problem. Um, which it's great to solve problems, but if, if all you're ever trying to do is solve problems, you'll find more problems. So it's a little bit of a dangerous cycle to be stuck in. So the first big step in the retreat was achieving that stillness and that ability to look inward. And then when I looked inward, what I found was instead of being present, I'm constantly looking outside of myself. For me personally, again, from my athletic background, that's very based on approval of others. What do other people think? Am, am I winning races? Am I this shiny, wholesome American, you know, right on your TV screen? Like that was my, that was, that was me for a long time. And I just didn't have to be that way anymore, but I'd never broken the habit. And being present like that, I turned in and I saw myself. I saw my tendency to overreact when what the situation actually called for was again, find that stillness instead of acting out, find your peace. Awesome. One of the things that my, my mentor's name was Robin Amos, and um, he said, we need to develop uh, new methods of inward orientation. Developing new methods of inward orientation. So new, new habits have to be created. Um, does anybody get in a rut with their habits? Anybody? Right? You get in habits, don't you? And then you get in those ruts and you don't get out of those. And some of those habits are not just what you eat for breakfast or what you do on Saturdays. You know, it is the mental habits. Sometimes we can fixate on certain events in the past or what's happening now. And we can obsess about 
things. And we can hold on to grudges and we can have anger and fear and resentments that, that get us into these ruts. So it, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you was in the aftermath of this retreat, what kind of observations do you have in terms of observing some of the things that you're used to doing and now you're wanting to get out of that and what are you doing to make sure that, because you can't just go to a 10 day retreat all the time, you have to put it into practice. So what are you doing in order to put that into practice? Well, the first thing that I'm doing, which is similar from what I did before retreat, is that I do have an established time every day that I pray and meditate. And I also have um, different forms of literature. Sometimes that's my Bible. Sometimes that's my study. I like a study handbook. Sometimes that's actually not a religious book, but it's just a spiritual book that someone may have shared with me. But I do have a routine of reading some form of scripture and taking 20 to 30 minutes at a time to pray or meditate. And that, I think, I, that's, I think, very important. Um, it's very much like being an athlete that um, viewers see the big race, the big Olympic race, but they don't see the every day of training that goes into that. So the retreat was kind of like the big race, and yet the everyday practice is how to incorporate that into life. And then what I wanted to share based on some of the last things that you had said was about day seven of the retreat is when I really felt this sense of not having to overthink it. And it, it dawned on me, it's very much like, I know we probably all go to different types of church, but at my, at my, the church that I go to, the, the priest always says, you know, go out and share this with the world. And so very much like the retreat, you can't just go to retreat and then go back to your life. I really am trying to take the things I've learned and apply them to my life. And on the times that I mess up, sit with myself. You know, I, it's so easy to say, oh, I always blame my husband for stuff. Anybody else deal with that? That's a thing, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it yes. is. <laughs> but so the reality is that, um, the reality is that I, I lost my peace with myself. And before retreat, all I really had was, again, that like looking outside at others. So now that I'm back, when I have the urge to do that, or if I actually do that, all I can do now is say, I know a different way and I can try to practice it. Mm. I, that's awesome. You know, one of the things that, that I was taught was that being hard on yourself during in, in doing spiritual practices is just wasted time. Mm -hmm. Because there's, so that's totally different from where you're coming from with the uh, professional athleticism, right? Because your coaches are always telling you you've got to work harder and you've got to be hard on yourself. We had, you know, there's something, a, a nice little word that, that is called grace that we have within spirituality and, and Christianity. And that grace can't be seen, just the effects of grace are seen. So you just have to accept it. And some days you feel, a lot of times you feel... In meditation, you feel uh, uh, the term is dry. You just, there's no, there's nothing fluid. Everything seems choppy. And other times you're on, you know, the top of the mountain and you feel great. Um, so let's transition here just real quick. I, I, I want this to be a practical application for you all as well. And to realize that some of these things that we're talking about are ap applicable uh, in everybody's life. So what kind of advice would you give um, anybody here who's interested in applying some of these methods or some of the concepts that we're talking about? Well, the first thing that I would suggest is having that daily time that you set aside. And it doesn't have to be, you know, every day at 11 o'clock. For me, it's every day right after I drink my coffee. And it doesn't matter if I'm up at 5 a.m. or 10 a.m. I make a coffee, I read, I read my spiritual book, and then I have my 30 minutes where I pray and meditate. Um, so having that scheduled time 
set aside has helped me be consistent. And to your point, not every day is good. Some days you sit there for 30 minutes and you daydream the whole time. If, if that happens to you, that's normal. But some days you sit there and you have the 30 most peaceful minutes you've had all week. And when, the, when you always save that time, it doesn't matter if it's a good or a bad day. This is what I'm doing right now. And I remember having that feeling on retreat of being anxious and I wanna go do something and I wanna be busier than I am. And then realizing, but this is what I'm doing right now. So if that feeling of like, but I have to be busy, I have to be moving, if that comes up, um, maybe just again, like you're saying, having a little bit of grace to say, this is my pattern, but it's not necessarily, it may not be serving me right now. Maybe what's serving me is to set that daily time aside. And then I did have a lot of, of the girls on retreat ask me about how I maintained a practice. I started practicing with two minutes a day with, I, I have a different mantra, but I just started with a mantra. And then I got into mindful, I would do like mindfully brushing my teeth. I would mindfully have a snack. I would, I would remember to pray before meals. These teeny tiny little things that eventually turned into five minutes and 10 minutes and up to 30 minutes. But I've been meditating for seven years. I did not start with 30 minutes at a time. I started with two minutes at a time. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Set that time aside and start very, very slow. Um, one of my favorite coaches, one of the few really healthy coaches I had always reminded me, over time, not overnight. And that, that's the way. Are there any other points from the retreat that you wanted to, to bring up? Any other insights before we get to some questions? Yeah, I'll share one more. Um, I, I, wanted, I want to bring a little more background into my day seven because day seven was my hardest day. And what you do in this retreat is first you learn how to observe your breath. And it's um, a way of, if your thoughts have gone off over here, it's a way of bringing them back. And you're supposed to focus right on the tip of your nose. And that helps you just quiet everything down. And then there's a process called a body scan where you scan your body. And, and I couldn't, I could barely even maintain the focusing on my nose. And I went to the teacher about that and I said, I, I'm having such a hard time you know, the bell would gong and I would sprint out of that building because I was so uncomfortable being still. And um, she said to me, you're in the middle of a storm. And when you're in the middle of a storm, she said, imagine your practice like a boat. And if you're in the middle of a storm, the first thing you do is you pull your sails in. You don't try to do too much. You pull the sails in and you hunker down and you go where you're safe. And for me, that when I did that in meditation, that became a surrender. That became, hey, I, I don't bring the waves. All I do is sit here and try to survive. And that moment of surrender was very powerful for me. I understood the concept of a surrender, but a true emotional of like giving up and okay, God, just give me what I need. Um, that was a surrender and that was an acceptance. And I would say that that was a real moment of peace. Um, and so I, I did wanna share that because I thought that was meaningful to point out that there was a significant struggle and it was embracing the struggle, accepting it. And okay, you, get, you give me what I need. I'll just pull the sails in and I'll survive, but I'm listening to what you have to say. That was a turning point. There's a, a, a term in the early church called synergia, and it means through Christ, God has already taken a step toward us. So that's an automatic advance toward you individually. I'm not talking to anybody else, but just you. So God's already taken a step toward you. Your job in life is to take to figure out how to take a step toward God, whatever that may look like, and that's what this is. And when you get up and you start to meditate or try to do something in terms of your devotions or whatever it is you're going to do after this awesome talk that is a step toward god then what happens god automatically it's a law that god automatically 
in return takes a step towards you. And then you have to figure out how to take that next step. Then God automatically, see, and you, just like the prodigal son, you get closer and closer and closer to God the more you work at it. We don't, we're not going for gold medals. We're not going for time. We're not going for any kind of achievement. We're going for a presence. We're trying to get closer to God. And that's the goal. So anything, any kind of um, step forward toward God is a positive thing. We're not being graded. And that's one of the things I imagine that really is wonderful for you is just knowing that it's just cool. Everything's fine. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, and that goes back to that I, that idea of just accepting accepting what is, um, because as an athlete, I was very, well, this is good and this is bad, and I want only good things in my life, and I wanna just train so hard that nothing bad ever happens to me ever again. And in the retreat, the teacher would call that type of thinking, tying knots. That was a beautiful way for me. I would tie myself in knots over have being so anxious about the bad things and so attached to the good things which neither of those are actually being present in the present moment like it just is you know even if it's a good moment here it is and then it's the next moment and here it is and then it's the next moment and it it reminds me a lot of um a lot of the passion of Christ because I think you'll help me the scripture is look how I make my suffering new is that the scripture it's because he's not angry about his suffering he's not wishing it would end it's just this moment and it's this moment and it's this moment even in something unbearable unbearable torture and he could just make it new because he wasn't tying knots about it he was just experiencing that moment as part of his life yeah.